And now it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker this morning, Dr. Gordon Mitchell, who is a professor at the University of Florida and will be talking about the brain and the respiratory system. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you all for showing up on this snowy Saturday morning. Um, I guess I'd like to begin by just pointing out one thing, and that is that for me, the act of speech and walking tend to be coupled. So if I fail at my job and I wander away from the podium, my leash, just be patient, chuckle a little, and I'll, with a little embarrassment, find my way back. Dr. Dampney, that'll be an example of stress-induced cardiovascular alterations. No, Dr. Abood, I don't think I'll faint. But I will be hyperventilating. But I'm doing that already. I'm speaking in public, sort of the broadcast mode, and when you do that, your CO2 levels in the lung drop, oxygen rises, hyperventilation is the normal. But what I'd really like to say is, of course, I'm using my respiratory control system right now. What more graphic example could you have that the brain controls breathing? When we teach professional students or undergraduates, though, we tend to emphasize more the automatic parts. I didn't say autonomic, and we'll make that point later. We talk about the respiratory chain. We talk about the series of events that must be linked in order to deliver oxygen to the tissues, remove carbon dioxide. And that chain begins with convection, and that convection is ventilation. In order to gener generate that convection, we need the actions of respiratory muscles, the diaphragm, the chest wall muscles, and of course, that is governed by the central nervous system. So that's what we'll be talking about for the next hour. When I talk to groups, for example, of medical students, you still need to convince them that the brain somehow has something to do with breathing. What's the connection? It's not quite as simple as you think. The obvious is the connection through the spinal cord, innervating the respiratory pump muscles. It's that simple. You can hear it. You know what we're doing. The diaphragm is contracting, but I, I invoked others, and we'll talk about that in a minute, other respiratory muscles that can also pump gas. And in fact, in rodents at least, without the phrenic nerves, without diaphragmatic activity, you can still breathe. What they often don't think about is the involvement of upper airway muscles that control upper airway resistance. These are, of course, innervated by cranial nerves, and I think most people fail to appreciate how critical this is. Each and every breath that you take, there's a volley of synaptic input to the motor neurons that innervate, for example, your genia glossus muscle of the tongue. What's the role of that input? It's to keep the upper airway open. It's really easy to invoke an image as to what goes wrong when you fail at that job. Just think of sleep, think of someone a little overweight. What do they sound like? So that is also a critical task. And we need to remember that breathing is not so simple as thinking about breathe in, breathe out. There are a lot of respiratory muscles. I just talked about these upper airway muscles. All the pharyngeal musculature is involved in controlling upper airway resistance. Of course, there's the diaphragm, and sometimes we overestimate the importance of that. It's very important, which doesn't mean we don't overestimate it, because other muscles can contribute in very important ways under different circumstances. For example, the intercostal, both external and internal intercostals, at all these different segments. We also have sternocleidomastoids, you have the scalenus, and all of these muscles must be coordinated in concert. That's a pretty substantial job. It's not as simple as in and then out. So we have a rather sophisticated control system to accomplish that task. Now one of the other points, and I alluded to it a moment ago, is that we often teach physiology where we link the respiratory and the cardiovascular system. And clearly that is important. How else would you get the oxygen delivery to the tissues, the carbon dioxide removal? However, this is truly autonomic control, and this kind of isn't. You're talking about striated muscle. The act of breathing is striated muscle. It's alpha motor neurons. There's voluntary control. It is automatic, and we tend to fool that. It's very nice that for all of you sitting here, you don't have to think about breathing, although I've probably disturbed you a little bit there. You're probably wondering what you're doing right now. What these muscles and this, these motor neurons and, in fact, these neural networks have more in common with, perhaps, aside from their linkage to cardiovascular system, is other somatic motor behaviors, which rely on similar striated muscle, alpha motor neuron, etc. It's simply a bit more automatic. 
So don't confuse those. So to talk about how we handle this complexity, how we generate the breath, one of the first things is to kind of separate the processes, the essential processes involved in making a breath happen. The first is you've got to have rhythm. We've got to have a rhythm generator, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Then once you have that rhythm, you have to distribute that. It's a process known as pattern formation. You have to distribute it to all the different muscles I just alluded to whether they're upper airway resistance muscles or the pump muscles of the thoracic and abdominal region. Now on top of this, you're going to have control over how well the system is functioning. You'll have negative feedback. You'll have a variety of sensory inputs. We'll review some of those. You'll have a variety of modulatory inputs. Modulatory inputs such as RAFE, serotonergic neurons, a variety of other things, noradrenergic neurons, that can clearly influence breathing. But they do it not only in real time, but a point I will make is that they also govern an underappreciated property of the respiratory motor control system, the property of neuroplasticity. So once you have that breath, you have to regulate it. And as Dr. Dampney already reviewed for you quite nicely, sensory feedback, negative feedback control is a fundamental principle of physiology and regulation of homeostasis, but so too is feed-forward control. Feed-forward meaning that you're responding in advance of a disturbance, but so too in the engineering kind of jargon that one uses when we created those concepts in physiology is adaptive control, and that's another way of saying plasticity. So the first question to talk about is where does the rhythm originate? We're going to take the simple path here. We don't have time to talk about the intricacies, the exceptional advances that have been made in the last several decades, the last perhaps 25 years. But way back when, before 100 years, the approach was more like this. In an anesthetized animal, you can simply cut the neuraxis. And what you can do is look at the breathing that occurs. And you can look at the breathing in this anesthetized animal before and after you cut the vagus nerves. Well, the first thing that tells you is that the vagus nerves, well, the breathing doesn't look the same, does it? There's something very important in those. Those are often taught in classic medical school curricula, and we're going to review them ever so briefly here, although we'll talk more about other things, more recent advances more extensively. But here's the point. If you make that cut just rostral to the pons, the brain stem itself, You've got good rhythm. The vagus can have its big effect. If you cut in the middle of the pons, you still get pretty good rhythm, but without a vagus, you get this apneustic, very pathological-looking breathing pattern. may not be so effective. If you cut right at the top or the rostral edge of the medulla, still there's something that you recognize as breathing. But if you cut at the medullary spinal junction, now it's gone. What does that tell you? It's just one simple message, and a lot of times I notice professional students, undergraduates forget this. It's in the medulla. That's the essential substrate for the act of breathing, generating that rhythm. Now, the modern view on this was really influenced from the, the mid-'80s on, when uh, Suzui in Japan published a paper where he sort of resurrected an old type of preparation. It used to be done in goldfish in 1931. Lord Adrian published in that regard. But he simply has a neonatal rat, brainstem, and spinal cord that he's placed in vitro. Now, there are no muscles to control. There's no breathing happening. But this neural tissue thinks that it has a job to do. And it continues to send volleys of activity out, the different spinal rootlets that are entrained with what would be interpreted as a breath. Now, at about 1990, um, a further advance was made. Um, and that was using the same preparation, but now recording exclusively from the hypoglossal motor output. Remember, it has that synaptic volley linked to breathing. So we can use that as a marker of a respiratory rhythm. And you see you can also record oscillating membrane potentials from those motor neurons. Now, what they did was very simple. Jeff Smith, Jack Feldman, and colleagues simply sliced upwards until they thought they would no longer see this motor output or until they didn't see the motor output, and then they also slice the other way. And it turns out there's this tiny little slice of the medulla of a newborn rat that still produces a beautiful rhythmic motor output that you would have to interpret as breathing. That tells you that it's really localized within the medulla where that breathing occurs. And I won't go through a, too much of this, 
other than to say that they've gone on and, and they've really elaborated the neuroanatomy. You don't find this in most textbooks, but it's certainly out there, published well by individuals like Don McCrimmon, many others. And this is a, a, really a picture of the brain stem looking from the dorsal aspect down, and this is a side view of what's going on. And that little region right there in red, that critical region in red, is where the essential kernel for respiratory rhythm resides. And that's known as the pre-Butzinger complex. It's essential for normal rhythm generation in adult mammals. One can still debate the details as to how it does that, but I don't think people debate that it is essential for that process to occur. By the way, it's named after a very bad bottle of wine in the Betzinger region of France. There are also these premotor neurons. They're caudal to the pre-Butzinger complex. They're both the inspiratory and expiratory premotor neurons. These project down the spinal cord to the respiratory motor neurons, either monosynaptically or polysynaptically. I don't know if you can see this pointer very well. There's a very important region just below the facial nucleus here, area it's designated by a seven, the parafacial respiratory group, which has another respiratory rhythm generator associated with expiration, not inspiration, and the retrotrapezoid nucleus, which has important chemosensory properties responding to changes in carbon dioxide. And then as you go rostral, it loses its ventral respiratory column moniker because it goes dorsal, and you see a lot of these pontine respiratory group neurons that modify the breathing effort. Now, we don't have time to go into the different discussions that people have about what role each region plays, but needless to say, there's this well-defined column that is very important for normal breathing. There are sensory inputs that come through the nucleus of the solitary tract, whether they're vagal sensory inputs or, for example, carotid chemoafferent neuron inputs. And then there are modulatory neurons that we haven't shown here, and particularly we'll focus on the RAFE serotonergic neurons, and the adrenergic cell groups of the pons, locus ceruleus, A5, and others. All play a role in breathing. To talk about how breathing then is regulated once you've initiated the rhythm, once you've sort of used pattern formation to, to send the signal out, for example, in those pre-motor neurons I talked about. This is the translation of the rhythm through integrating pre-motor neurons, respiratory muscles, ventilation, gas exchange, until you find the regulated variables, the levels of arterial carbon dioxide, oxygen, and to a lesser extent, pH. There are a host of things that can disrupt this process, things that happen every moment of your life. Twist, you've changed the mechanics of your chest wall system. You need to, to alter how you breathe. Um, there can be pattern changes in your breathing, breathing faster or, or, and shallow or, or slow and deep. Dead space ventilation, which can occur with lung disease. Your metabolism changes every time you move, walk, run, whatever you're going to do. And experimentally, of course, we can change the inspired gases, which happens relatively infrequently for most people, except those perhaps that go up a mountain. All along this process of translation, we have feedback coming. We have feedback from chemoreceptors, and we'll talk about that extensively, mechanoreceptors in the lungs and chest wall muscles, that drive breathing, and all of those tell you, have you done a good job? Sources of sensory feedback. They can be mechanoreceptors, as I've said, and a lot of those very prominently are pulmonary stretch receptors, but they're also respiratory muscle receptors, uh, spindle afferent neurons, many others that can be inhibitory tendon organs. There's quite a long list here. I won't go through this as extensively here. I'm just going to sort of list it because these are things we've known for quite a while. The chemoreceptors themselves sense levels of oxygen in the arterial blood, for example, the peripheral chemoreceptors or carbon dioxide, more the role of central chemoreceptors. And I'll emphasize one more for those of you that may teach undergraduates, comparative physiology classes, and the like. There's a very important population of CO2-sensitive chemoreceptors that are in non-mammalian vertebrates, um, known as intrapulmonary chemoreceptors. Sensory receptors in the vagus nerve, I already alluded to the fact that the vagus is important. And we can certainly look in many books and older texts to find some of the involvement there. There are slowly adapting pulmonary stretch receptors. These are very important. Their endings are in the airway smooth muscle. They're activated by lung stretch and I think very importantly by bronchoconstriction. And when they increase their activity, it makes sense. There's the classic Breuer-Herring or Herring-Breuer reflex, whichever way you want to do it. It slows breathing. 
If your lung has too high of a volume, slow it down, let the gas get out. It terminates inspiration early, it prolongs expiration, that keeps the lung at a normal functional residual capacity, a reasonable lung volume. When there's bronchodilation, when there's bronchoconstriction, what will happen is you stimulate them and it elicits bronchodilation. It's like, it's like self-medication. And then it can also activate expiratory muscles, which if your lung is too full, let's push it out, see what we can do. Other sensory receptors in the vagus nerve, there are the rapidly adapting stretch receptors, otherwise known as irritant receptors, airway epithelial cells activated by irritant gases like ammonia. If you've ever gone in a pig pen or something like that, you, you know what I'm talking about. They increase ventilation and trigger bronchoconstriction, which has never made a lot of sense to me, but it's nevertheless something that they do. A more important group to me in some ways is the juxtapulmonary capillary receptors. These are C fibers, they're unmyelinated, located in the wall of pulmonary capillaries, and one of the things they're thought to be activated by is lung fluid. So in many cases of lung disease, the wet ones, the ones where there's, for example, edema in association, they can trigger a rapid irregular breathing pattern that is in fact characteristic of many lung diseases. Chemoreceptors. This one is pretty well known. The carotid bodies are widely studied for a long time since Hayman's first described them in the early 1900s. Located in the carotid bifurcation of the neck, activated, and here's what I usually emphasize to professional students, by decreased arterial oxygen. That's because they're the unique receptor that really senses that and controls breathing. But they are responsive to changes in arterial CO2. They are responsive to changes in pH independently from CO2. Their action is pretty obvious, they increase breathing. The aortic bodies are often mentioned in older textbooks, but they don't seem to do a lot normally for breathing. They're really more involved in cardiovascular regulation. Lovely receptor, senses hypoxia, just more involved in other kinds of reflexes. So what I tell the students usually is that if we look at how these carotid body receptors respond to low oxygen, they pretty well ignore decreasing oxygen until you get to levels around 60 millimeters of mercury. Then they increase their activity, their frequency of discharge briskly. And that triggers a beautiful ventilatory response. Now one can ask, why does this make sense? Why ignore so much of this? Well, I make sense of it in this sense. Hemoglobin is nearly fully saturated throughout most of this range. You're not compromising oxygen delivery. And it's really only when you begin to fall to desaturation of hemoglobin that the carotid bodies really pay attention. Now that's interesting because their proximate stimulus is the partial pressure, not the concentration or saturation of oxygen. But nevertheless, it's an interesting adaptation that I think suits us well given the properties of hemoglobin. Central CO2 sensitive neurons, there used to be a nice simple text explanation of what those were. I don't think it's simple anymore. There's a lot of debate, a lot of progress in this area. It's interesting, but we don't have time to talk about it extensively other than to say that there are many sites in the brainstem and cerebellum that seem to respond to CO2. They also seem to drive a chemoreflex. It's no longer just the ventrolateral surface of the medulla as many textbooks still will say. And people debate the relative significance of these different sites. And one of the arguments is that some of these sites are perhaps more significant in certain physiological states, wakefulness versus sleep, or that by sensing CO2 at many sites, you get a better assessment of whole brain carbon dioxide level and need, and breathing is only able to respond to that. But here's what we do know, is that increased CO2 activates or inhibits these receptors and increases breathing, the chemoreflex. Here you just see sort of a map of where some of these are with both a dorsal view and then the sagittal view. The last one I promised you is that there are these unique and very interesting chemoreceptors found in birds and most reptiles. Um, as an example, alligators. If you look at the vagus nerve, these are coursing through the vagus nerve and record single unit activity, you can find this population of receptors. That makes them unique. They're one of the very few CO2 specific chemoreceptors that you can record from and know exactly what you have and how they're behaving. And what we know is that unlike the model of the carotid body, as you increase CO2 in the lungs, their activity in fact decreases. They are inhibited by CO2. 
Often we have this bias that a chemoreceptor ought to increase its activity. But here we know that these also inhibit breathing. So with a double negative, the response is appropriate. As CO2 goes up, breathing goes up. Now it's interesting to follow the evolutionary history. Bill Milsom, uh, former chair of the Department of Zoology at University of British Columbia, gave me this picture. And that is that if you look at different taxa in the vertebrates, um, the story is this, that really only from birds on in evolution, crocodilians, lizards, snakes, etc., that's where you find these receptors. They aren't in all reptiles because turtles don't seem to have them. Mammals do not have them despite extensive efforts to find them, nor do you find them in amphibia or fish. So it's pretty unique, but they're very interesting, and I think their importance is from a more fundamental biological perspective, but also from the perspective that it gives you a model that CO2 chemoreception can also be an inhibitory, inhibitory system and still have the proper effect. So I'd like to turn now to some of the integrated ventilatory responses, trying to put this system back together. And so what we can really talk about is the importance of chemo feedback for CO2 and O2, and there are a lot of interesting interactions between these systems in a real breathing individual or, or other an animal species. There's also feed-forward regulation. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of examples of that, but one good one that Dr. Dampney has already mentioned is exercise hyperpnea. And then I'll focus a little bit on plasticity, because I know this is a little bit newer, at least to those that studied some of the older uh, texts. It's a persistent response to repetitive or chronic disturbances. The classic way to look at the CO2 chemo reflex is with negative feedback where what happens is if CO2 is elevated, perhaps because you added inspired carbon dioxide to the room, you activate CO2 chemoreceptors, and through the chemo reflux, you increase minute and therefore alveolar ventilation, and that, of course, prevents the increase in CO2 from being as great as it would have been. Classic negative feedback. Most everybody in this room, I'm pretty sure, is very familiar with that. The way that it looks if you just take an individual, for example, you seated here right now, is that we could measure your pulmonary ventilation, add inspired CO2 to the gas you're breathing, CO2 would go up, arterial PCO2 would go up, that is, and you're, you'd have essentially a linear increase in that pulmonary ventilation. Uh, despite most textbooks, which put a hockey stick down here, they say that there's no response below normal. I believe that there is a response in most circumstances. When you're asleep, you can see it or when you're exercising, especially if you're a non-human mammal, like a goat exercising on a treadmill, you can see responsiveness in this zone. So I think it's important to know that CO2 chemosensitivity is above and below normal resting levels. The integrated response gets very complex. One of the lectures that I often teach is the history of premature birth, infant respiratory distress syndrome. And so I introduce the students to the concept that continuous positive airway pressure when applied to a premature baby was, was a very important step in reversing the mortality, providing effective conditions for survival, in fact, in those babies. But then we come back and talk about it this way, that if you just had someone sitting here now and we applied a continuous positive airway pressure, what would happen? You'd be breathing with an increased pressure in a tube coming by your mouth. Your airway is open. It might inflate your lungs a little bit. And now you have a cascade of events. In increased lung volume, stretch receptor activation. And what does that do? It inhibits breathing. So breathing will start to decline, and because breathing starts to decline, carbon dioxide will start to rise. Well, of course, that now will trigger chemoreceptors. So the central, in particular, chemoreceptors will activate and say, hey, not so fast, and they will attempt to bring the CO2 back to, not reaching, but back towards normal. In other words, the ventilatory response will not, ventilation will not be as depressed. So that's classic negative feedback, but it's an integrative response that should be music to the heart of any integrative physiologist. Feed forward, as I said, we don't have many examples. The one that's really clear is the largest natural ventilatory response that happens in your life every single day. That's exercise hyperpnea. The increase in breathing that occurs with mild, moderate, or heavy exercise. Now, during that mild to moderate range, you see an increase in breathing directly proportional to the increased metabolic rate. 
and it's really good in humans. It keeps arterial PCO2 during mild or really moderate exercise very close to the resting level. They talk about the isocapnic hyperpnea, although I think that small deviations are sometimes obscured. In every other mammalian species I know that's ever been studied, and in fact every vertebrate species that's been studied during mild to moderate exercise, PCO2 does something a little different. It actually drops below normal during exercise. And that lets you know one thing. An increase in arterial CO2 did not cause the increase in breathing. CO2 went down. It cannot be chemofeedback in any classical sense. This is feed forward with respect to a change in arterial CO2. And in fact, in non-mammalian um, uh, species, vertebrates in particular, if you add carbon dioxide back to get the arterial blood back to normal resting, it'll increase breathing further. So the role of chemofeedback during exercise in most species is an inhibitory role. So feed forward it is. Do we know what it is? We could talk about that for hours or days. It's sort of a field that has really receded. I think there, there are new techniques that will really allow this to move forward in the future, but people need to pick up on this fact. We have no idea how that happens, even though I'll say it again, it's the largest natural ventilatory response in our daily lives. We do know that, as I said, it's modified by chemofeedback, and it's also modified by prior experience. In other words, there can be plasticity in the exercise ventilatory response, although I won't talk about that much here. Instead of integrated ventilatory response to carbon dioxide, we can talk about integrated ventilatory responses to changes in oxygen, whether it is hyperoxia or more commonly studied hypoxia. And this is about chemoreceptor feedback, but as soon as we say that, we need to talk about interactions with other inputs to breathing. But there also is a very big story that's begun, begun to emerge on respiratory plasticity. So we'll talk about a couple of different circumstances here. Each one makes a little bit of a point as to some of the important features. I do believe that it is probably true that changes in oxygen are bigger drivers to respiratory plasticity than changes in CO2 per se. Here's the thing that I often confront professional students with. First, we've shown them already that when arterial oxygen goes down, the carotid bodies respond and they drive breathing to increase in a hyperbolic response. Now what I fail to tell them is that that usually, the picture as I draw it, is with CO2 constant in the arterial blood. Yet when you bring reality of you climbing a mountain and experiencing hypoxia, you don't have constant CO2, do you? You increase your breathing, your CO2 decreases, and the story's not over. Because now you have CO2 chemoreceptors that will respond what will they do? They will inhibit. Remember, I talked about that side being kind of important. So the actual hypoxic ventilatory response you see is what the carotid bodies did minus what the central chemoreceptors did to blunt that response. You're, you have battling systems here. We want to increase breathing to maximize oxygen, but we don't want to overventilate and have too severe a hypocapnia. So you have that compromise that's so common in physiologic systems. Here's an example. I was in a vet school for many, many years, although I'm now uh, at the University of Florida. And this was a horse in that clinic that had sepsis, so it has lung problems, it has gas exchange problems, it has trouble breathing. But it illustrates this competition between hypoxic and hypercapnic responses in an animal that's intact, breathing on its own. These are arterial blood gas values when breathing air or with oxygen supplementation via nasal prongs. We don't know how much oxygen really got into the lungs, some. You look at the arterial oxygen, and here's what the goal was. The original arterial oxygen was 57 millimeters of mercury, and in veterinary circles, when you have a horse that has an arterial PO2 less than 60, they usually believe it's going to die. It's going to die from ventilatory failure, not because of the hypoxia, which is often inferred by the professional students. Many of you have been lower than that when you go skiing. That didn't kill you. But because mechanics are so bad, because things are in such bad shape, it's just a sign, just an indicator that, that it could be trouble. Nevertheless, they gave it supplemental oxygen, and you see they were successful to a point. They raised it to 69 millimeters of mercury. And even with that small increase, the CO2 is what I find instructive. It was 32. They were hyperventilating, trying to keep oxygen up in the arterial blood. And now that you've taken away some of the hypoxic stimulus that made that happen, Look what happened to CO2, 58. They're now hypoventilating. 
You can't separate one system from the other if you really want to know what's happening in a patient or in yourself. Many things that professional students, med students, vet students will do is they'll give gaseous anesthetics, and this is a very old slide, but it's true for more modern gaseous anesthetics to a varied extent as well. Certainly isoflurane will do this also. If you look at arterial oxygen pressure and you look at what happens to the normal hypoxic response curve, in a slightly halothane anesthetized individual, these are humans where this was drawn from, from the studies of NIL a number of years ago, you find that oh my gosh, the hypoxic response is not only gone, when you get to lower oxygen, you can actually see some depression. Now, that is clearly not a good response to hypoxia. So the watchdogs are, are basically sleeping. So that's a dangerous time. Many people underappreciate the impact of gaseous anesthetics on the peripheral chemoreceptors. Another kind of thing that can show is that in addition to problems with decreased chemoreceptor gain, you can have increased chemosensitivity, and that can lead to very unusual circumstances such as this. This is actually me sleeping at altitude, and what happens is while I'm asleep at about 14,000 feet equivalent, you can see I'm breathing like a turtle, for heaven's sakes. Three breaths, long pause, three breaths. This is a central neural outflow failure. This is a central apnea. It's not obstruction. And what it's due to is chemoreflex loop gain, which has been elevated to the point that it created instabilities. So while I was asleep, I was the experimental animal. They could increase the carbon dioxide just a little bit to drive breathing. They could lower the oxygen a bit, or excuse me, increase the oxygen a bit. And I'd quickly transition back to regular rhythmic breathing as you'd like to see it. But this explains some of the insomnia at altitude that mountain climbers experience. First days up, they're always complaining that they didn't get good sleep. Because each one of these apneas results in a profound hypoxemia, shown here as a decrease in oxygen saturation, an arousal event, and off you go again. So it's a little bit like obstructive sleep apnea in that sense. But this is due to increased chemoreflex loop gain rather than a problem with decreased loop gain. Another thing that we're gaining wide appreciation for is the prevalence and the problems associated with obstructive sleep apnea. It's really increasing in prevalence quite dramatically. It's quite different from that central apnea. It's when the upper airways no longer stay open. Remember I said that's a critical issue as well, not just pump muscles. Of course, the tongues and whatnot, the pharyngeal musculature can collapse, and you'll have profound pump muscle activation. You try to breathe against that closed airway, but how much gas flow do you get? Nothing until you arouse, clear that upper airway, and start over. And that happens over and over, between 10 and over 100 times per hour, all night long. So that's a pretty serious problem. It's highly prevalent in, in children, it's highly prevalent in middle-aged men, and postmenopausal women do their best to catch up with men, from what I can tell. It's highly prevalent, and this is underappreciated, it's very prevalent, is really what I'd say, in m most neurological disorders. Alzheimer's, far more than 50%. Um, Down syndrome, almost all those kids have sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. This is a big thing to think about in different clinical situations. Then there's severe morbidity associated with the chronic intermittent hypoxia, and I should have written down, and sleep fractionation that results from that failure of ventilatory control, a failure to regulate upper airway versus pump muscle. Now, one of the things that I've always wondered about is why is it that some of you in this room don't have sleep apnea. I see candidates that probably do, but many of you don't. <laughs> You're younger, that's your hint. Why don't you? Um, it's because I think in your age group, you're in that golden age where compensatory mechanisms may help, help offset the tendency for sleep disordered breathing. If you lose that, you succumb. And that compensation and that introduces this concept, because it was really thinking about that that led, led us, in particular, to, to a number of different thoughts about what those compensation mechanisms might be, and the concept that there is plasticity in the neural control of breathing. Really, before the 80s, there was nothing at all discussed about that. Through the 80s, still not a friendly environment to talk about that. It was really only in the 90s and beyond that, that we began to realize how important this is, even though there were examples we can find, clear examples, more than 100 years old. What we're talking about is a fundamental property of the respiratory control system like it is with every other neural control system I'm aware of. It would be very unusual for it not to be highly prevalent in the control of breathing. 
We're talking about a change in future respiratory system behavior based on an experience. And the operative word that's really important there is future. So experiences change how you respond the next time. That's what we're talking about. Why would that be significant? It could be very important for adaptation to new environments, for example, altitude or physiologic conditions, weight gain, weight loss, pregnancy, a variety of other things. It could be important as a compensation for the onset of lung or neural disease. It could guide development of new therapeutic strategies, and I think it already is. Um, you can see examples of that in a talk by Randy Trumbauer tomorrow. And then we need to remember, plasticity is not always good. Sometimes it's bad. And it can occur both in development and in adults. One example we've known for a very long time is really ventilatory acclimatization to chronic hypoxia, altitude acclimatization. And what we're talking about here is just what happens when you ascend very quickly. In this case, you just have inspired oxygen drop to about, oh, maybe 12% or so. Breathing goes up, classic chemoreflex, and because of that, CO2 goes down. Again, the result of that chemoreflex. So now you have the battle between chemoreceptors of CO2 and low oxygen. But then over days or weeks, the ventilation progressively goes up more and more and more. And it allows the arterial CO2 to drop more and more and more. And there, there used to be quite substantial arguments about how that happened. The way that I read the outcome of those arguments is that a lot of this, it turns out, is through neuroplasticity at the level of the carotid body chemosensor itself. And what you can see, for example, this is work really from Jerry Biscard's lab over many years, is that if you take a carotid body, the green is stained for tyrosine hydroxylase, so those are chemosensitive cells that are going to innervate the chemoafferent neurons that go to the brain. But that's the carotid body in normoxia. And then if you have one week of hypoxia, look at it, it's hypertrophied. It's bigger. And in fact, it's more sensitive. If you record from those carotid chemoafferent neurons, they're much more sensitive to low oxygen. And that shows up as an enhancement of the hypoxic ventilatory response in individuals that have been in chronic hypoxia. It's really peripheral chemoreceptor plasticity. But there is also central neural plasticity. And that's what we'll talk about next. The thinking really came from what I was talking about before. It's not so clear that we've closed all the loops on this. But when you have sleep disordered breathing like obstructive sleep apnea, you have intermittent hypoxia, not to mention intermittent arousals, sleep fractionation. Many pathological consequences. This is an incredibly long list, and I've shortened it here. One way to think about this is that it, it's just a tremendous cause of pathological conditions such as hypertension, depression, insomnia, and a lot of these can be related to an inflammatory brain disease condition. I mean, it really causes profound central neural inflammation. On the other hand, I talked about the idea of compensation. Most good physiologic systems fight back. The idea was that plasticity would be engaged, keep those upper airways open, and prevent all this badness from happening. Now, we don't know if the model I'm about to show you does that, but it was a model that allowed study that plasticity is, in fact, very prominent in the neural control of breathing. It was based on studies from Dave Milhorn, Fred Eldridge, and the group at North Carolina back in 1980. They then kind of left it behind. But what they did was episodically stimulate the carotid sinus nerve of anesthetized cats and show that even an hour, 90 minutes after they stopped, breathing was changed. There was a memory when they did that. Or you can take low oxygen. Here you can see, i run out of pointer. Well, there it is. You can see integrated phrenic nerve activity, in this case, in a rat. Those are fictive breath, breaths because this rat is anesthetized, paralyzed, and and ventilated, so it's breathing with, through the ventilator. And then you can take the oxygen to an arterial oxygen of about 40, 45 millimeters of mercury. Breathing goes up, classic chemofeedback response, and then down. And if you do one single episode and then you stop, that, the story is over. I have nothing more to tell you. But if you five minutes later do it again, and five minutes later yet again, now you see this long-lasting increase. And in fact, it's a ramping increase in front of motor output, even though the conditions are the same. That's a memory. That's a memory that before, one hour before, you had three episodes of hypoxia. That means there was plasticity to underlie that. This is a phenomenon known as phrenic long-term facilitation. This is in the phrenic neurogram, not hypoglossal. If you do one single long sustained episode, um, nothing. So pattern sensitivity is an essential feature of this form of plasticity.
What we've done over the years is look at this, and this was the state of the art about over 10 years ago now. Um, we began to appreciate some of the cellular mechanisms of phrenic long-term facilitation, just a model for neuroplasticity in the control of breathing. And we suggested then it had therapeutic implications. I think it already has had some therapeutic um, success trying to tap into this and harness it for ways that I'd explain on another day. I'll try to allude to them at the end here. But basically, we know that within phrenic motor neurons per se, there's a series of events that really leads to a strengthening of the synaptic input that we recognize as a breath. And it starts with these neuromodulatory inputs coming from RAFE serotonin neurons. Every hypoxic episode, serotonin is released and this cascade occurs. We have decent evidence that at least key events are within the motor neurons now, and that what's going to happen is it's going to strengthen this glutamate-containing synapse so that it's like turning up the volume on a stereo, but on your motor neuron. So it listens more, produces more output, more diaphragmatic contraction, more muscular force, more breathing. There are also examples of developmental plasticity and ventilatory control. This has become widely appreciated in other parts of the nervous system. Newsweek even said, a baby's brain is a work in progress, trillions of neurons waiting to be wired into a mind. The experiences of childhood, pioneering research shows, helped form the brain's circuits for music and math, language and emotion, and I think they forgot, and breathing. And what we're talking about here, for example, is if you take a newborn rat and you expose it to enriched oxygen, 30 to 60 percent, not enough to cause hyperoxic toxicity, just enough to suppress carotid body chemoreceptors from firing. What will happen is instead of a normal, healthy adult carotid body, you get this hypoplastic carotid body that is very much like a fetal carotid body. It's like it never matured. It's relatively insensitive to low oxygen. And what, in fact, you find in these animals is that as adults, many months later, they don't have the, the high, uh, high excuse me, response to low oxygen that a normal rat would have. It's suppressed. You know, you've let your watchdogs sleep again in this case, for a lifetime, and that can have pathological consequences, we think. And it turns out that in humans that have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, they were premature and now they've grown up with that, that issue. They were probably in intensive care units because of their prematurity. Now when they're 18, Melissa Bates has recently shown that they too lack a normal hypoxic response. This seems to translate from rats to humans. One of the things that we, we often forget about in the neural control of breathing is, is linking it back to the many different clinical disorders that challenge respiratory control. We often think about the ones that are obvious, sleep apnea, sudden infant death syndrome, even though that may be cardiovascular as well as breathing, congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, those are all obvious. But there are abnormalities in the control of breathing and heart failure, apnea prematurity, Rett syndrome, and profound mental retardation, stroke hyperventilation disorders, we can just keep going on. And these often are instabilities in breathing. That's really what you're talking about. Abnormal breathing because it's unstable. But there's a whole other type, and that's with diminished capacity to breathe. And we don't think about them as breathing disorders, but oh my, they are. Spinal cord injury, biggest cause of death, failure to breathe. ALS, spinal muscular atrophy, biggest cause of death, failure to breathe. You have to compensate as long as you can in order to stay alive. Infectious diseases like polio, muscular dystrophy, other diseases like muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, they all have limitations on the capacity to breathe. And our feeling is that by understanding plasticity in particular, we can harness them as treatments, for example, to restore lost capacity. So with diverse clinical disorders, there often is a similar therapeutic goal. I mean, we've often compared spinal cord injury with motor neuron disease and thought about sleep apnea. We don't study that in rodents because they don't have it. But with spinal cord injury, when you've lost some synaptic inputs, most spinal injuries are partial. There's something left, but it may be ineffective, not enough to breathe adequately, drive the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm. If you harness plasticity, we can strengthen that, turn the volume up, and make it work. That's the concept. We've shown proof of principle in rodents, and we're gearing up to do that in humans. Turns out this also spills over, however, to locomotion. And we've already shown that in humans with chronic spinal injury, it can enhance their walking quite substantially, even with chronic injuries where they have no prognosis for further improvement. Motor neuron disease, the difference is you've lost your neighbor, so your choice is to breathe half as much or do something about it. And rats already, we know, increase the synaptic inputs to these motor neurons, and they also sprout on the other end and increase the size of their motor units. And they keep breathing quite effectively preserved, despite major losses of respiratory motor neurons.
My real point is that we need to expand our look and consider control of breathing in a much broader context where we start thinking about translation of our basic science to treat a lot of different devastating clinical disorders that we don't usually think of as breathing problems, but they are. They compromise breathing and the quality and duration of life. So with that, I'll say thank you.